All right, we will make a start. Um, welcome everybody to National Ag Day and uh, Farmer Time session here presented by Primary Industries Education Foundation Australia. And uh, today we're very fortunate to have um, Jason Shields from, um, it's a Plunkett, Plunkett, um, Plunkett Orch Orchards. Plunkett yep. Orchards in, uh, in Victoria. And uh, we're very pleased to have um, uh, horticulture represented uh, as part of all the wonderful diverse industries and, and different ways we produce food in Australia. We've had uh, cotton and forestry and uh, uh, we've had uh, beef cattle, uh, a range of different industries over the last two days. And so um, we're very uh, grateful to have Jason with us today. So I'll hand it all over to, to Jason and we will have time for questions um, later on. And if you do have questions along the way, could you please write them in the chat area of, um, of the uh, session here? And we would ask you to um, make sure you keep your um, microphones muted and, uh, and, your, and your cameras off. Thank you. Over to you, Jason. Thank you. Uh, g'day. Um, my name's Jason Shields. As he said, I'm the manager at uh, Plunkett Orchards. Um, Plunkett Orchards is a 102-year-old business in the uh, Ardmona in the Golden Valley of Australia. Um, so we're a fourth generation farm. Um, Andrew, who is the general manager, he's the, the son of Noel and Margaret Plunkett, who are still here as well. So we had the third and the fourth generation and Andrew has two kids that potentially might be the fifth generation um, like coming through that are, that are just in high school now. So um, if we look back at, at Plunkett as, as a business, um, you know, 20 years ago, I started here um, in the industry and, you know, probably horticulture was probably a little bit of a, you know, apples grows on trees um, kind of thing where you know, now these days it's a lot more precision ag agriculture. Um, so we started off here when I was here 20 years ago, we started off with about 40 hectares. Um, and now 20 years later, that was with one property. Now 20 years later, we have five properties and about 250 hectares. Um, it's, I'm just sitting here now in our packing shed. So the packing shed behind me, we just, this little bit here that was just behind me now, it was the original packing shed. So it was about a hundred meters by about 50. And now our packing shed in the, over the last 20 years is about five hectares of land. Um, so we've just, we've just invested a, a lot of money and just um, expanded it again, but every sort of five years it's, it's doubled in size. So um, yeah, it's a pretty exciting time to be in horticulture. Um, we generally, we just grow 80% of our crop now is apples. Um, and in that we probably 30% of them are pink ladies, probably 25, 30% are granny Smith apples, uh, 20 Smith are gala. And then we have about 15% of our apples, are, um, you know, the, the new varieties, which are like Tansy, My Apple, Rocket, all the new fancy apples that are in the supermarkets now that you've probably seen on your shelves that you've never seen before, for, except for the last couple of years. Um, but on a whole, we've stuck with the we've stuck with the generic ones that everyone knows and everyone loves, like the pink lady apple. Um, you know, and we every single year we're planting about twenty thousand trees, and a majority of them are pink lady apple. Um, so as I said, we've. Now we have 250 hectares of land um, across five sites. And we've just, we've just purchased another property that we, we start to plan to start again um, because all of our sites now are all full. So yeah, it's an exciting time in horticulture. Um, you know, things used to be pretty boring. Um, you know, everything was pretty basic. Everything was done, you know, pretty much most farms were just ran by their you know, the owner and the son and all that sort of stuff where, you know, these days it's, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for people to get out and get good jobs in farms. You know, previously the only jobs in farms used to be probably picking fruit. Maybe if you're lucky, you got to, you know, we got, kept a third of the people to, to prune the trees. And if you're really, really lucky, you got to, uh, to drive one tractor. 
Um, you know, where these days, if you look at uh, a business like ours, which there's many of, um, I'm not a I'm not a son. I'm I'm a straight out. I'm just a manager. I've I've been here for 20 years though. But you know, I'm the manager. I have underneath me, and I just do the orchard. Underneath me, I have another three assistant managers. Um, you know, underneath them, we have five tractor drivers. Underneath them, we have eight machine drivers. So it's you know. There's a lot of potential, a lot of room for um, upskilled labour force now, um, especially now that most farms are more going sort of corporate style. Um, you know, most of the little farms are, are dying out, but you know, there's a lot of room for you know people that aren't owners for really good jobs and really good job experience in um, in the industry. So you know that that's that's really exciting. Um, Basically, as I said, we went, we grow pink ladies, galas, um, and Granny Smiths are our main varieties. We also grow about twenty percent of our fruit as pears, um, and then nearly and they're all solely now um, pack and pears, except for one new Delisa, which is one new variety, which is called Rico, that you might have seen on your shelf in the supermarkets, but you might see it in the next year or two. It's a it's a red blush pear. It's a very 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 tasty pear. Um, so if you do see it on your shelf, I would highly recommend if you don't like pears to give it a go. It, it's, it's, a very, it's a very nice pear. Um, so probably one of the, you know, one of the key things that I personally, that I love about uh, horticulture, about growing fruit, is that there really isn't, you could probably say there's a, not a week go by, but there's at least not a month go by that, that what I do is the same. Um, and a lot of the times of the year, there's not a week that goes by that what I do is the same. Um, so, you know, we, back in the day, there used to be just be a season and you're really busy just at harvest and you never really did much else. You did some pruning of some trees, you watered them. But now the way that we grow our trees and, and the style of way we grow, it's, it's really precision ag agriculture. Um, you know, and we basically, our season doesn't really end, although our harvest season ends, um, we are constantly busy all the time. So just as an example, um, you know, in my peak period when I'm picking the most, I might get up to 90 to 100 people um, out in the field at any time, where in my low, um, except for when we have a month off over June, July sort of period at the start of winter, in my low, we, we will have 50 people. And most of the time, probably 60 for nine months of the year. So there's not the peaks and the troughs that there used to be. Um, so, you know, that, that's a, a really good thing for someone that's looking for work because it's not just a, you know, a seasonal work anymore as an actual career and a full-time career here. Um, you know, but when you do work in horticulture, um, you know, it's for us, we have a 12 month season. So, you know, basically we've just gone through spring, which was, um, you know, is when the buds start to move and the flowers come out. Um, you know, so at that point in the time, we are, we're trying to bring in, you know, we have to, we're counting how many flowers are on a tree because although fruit does grow on trees, um, you know, we're precision agriculture now. So we know that we want, depending on the variety, depending on how many trees per hectare we've planted, we know exactly how many fruit we want in that tree. Um, you know, so we'll have a number, which it might be a hundred, and then when we prune, we try and prune back to 130 buds. Um, you know, so then when the trees flower, there's 130 flower clusters um, there. And then so we're going through and we're counting them. And then based off the numbers that we count, we do things like we bring in bees to pollinate the flowers to make sure that they set. We do things like thinning sprays and, and mechanically thinning is a new thing that we've just started. We're probably the only people in Australia that are doing it. Um, you know, which we are physically knocking flowers off. Um, you know, so that's, and, and all this happens really rapidly. It's like two or three weeks. It's, and it's, for me, it's my busiest time and it's my time and it's, it's the most stressful time, but it's, it's also the most invigorating because if you get it right, it's, um, you know, everything is so good, but if you get it wrong, which we did in a couple of blocks this year, um, for the next two or three months, you, you're walking around with your lip down and, and um, you know, although out of our hundred blocks, it was only three blocks we got wrong. Um, you know, for the every day and every night I go to sleep, and every morning I wake up, I think about those three blocks that um, that we knocked too much fruit off. Um, you know, but it's a really exciting time. We also we have 
many tractor drivers out there because we're worried about pests and disease at this same point in time. So um, although it's not really busy for the, the workforce, we're still printing at that time for management decisions and, and key staff, it's a really important time. Um, I've got a little video if, that I could show that's, um, that shows our new mechanical thinner. Um, if I can, can I share screen? Do I have access? Yep. No. You're, you're a co-host, yep. so you should be yep. able to. Yep, yep, I just didn't have it open enough. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so as I said, if I just go to this one first, like this is, you know, this is my life a month ago, you know, flowers everywhere, orchards beautiful. Every single this time of the year, I'm just, you know, it, it just makes you feel amazing. It's like nothing's gone wrong yet. It's, it's all good. There's plenty of flowers. You look at the trees, you look at the flowers and, and, you know, you look at these flowers here that I've got and there's just an abundance of them. On these trees, for example, we want 170 fruit and I had about 250 clusters of flowers. So, you know, I had to remove some. So we brought in the, me the mechanical thinner, um, which you can see here on the tractor. I've got a little video of a um, clip of it, of it playing. So you can, oh, sorry. So it physically is like a whip, a giant whippersnipper. It's, um, it goes, you know, it just sends the strings through the tree and whippersnips flowers off the trees. Um, so we've had some really, really, really good results with it, um, you know, to the point where we have knocked off, you know, potentially if we want 100 fruit, sometimes we might set 300 fruit. Um, we have got back to the point where we are at, you know, 25% of what we need, which is perfect because if we get to what we need, you can never get to what you need. You get to what you need, you've knocked off too many, which I have a couple of those blocks this year, um, you know, sort of thing. So. But yeah, so that's where we start. That's that's spring. Um, obviously, in the winter, before this point in time, we've we've done that pruning where we prune back to those bud numbers, like what I um like what I explained before. Um, you know, we've we've also now got a you know we've set up our orchard with another another machine um, to be able to help us with this. Um, so I think I I think I have a recording of that machine. Um, sorry. didn't come too super prepared but here's our so here's our saw we send the saw through first and we can just trim back the branches like that um, you know and we can do about 30 percent of the job um, it doesn't do a perfect job but it does enough of the job and it's a nice consistent job that we can then just come in and touch it up the last of it by hand um, you know, so as I said, we, we aim at a, you know, it's all precision agriculture now. We, um, we aim at a certain number of fruit that we want on a tree because we know if we get that certain number of fruit, we're going to get the exact size we want. We're going to get the exact colour we want. It's not all about, uh, you know, back in the day, you know, fruit just grows on trees. Um, it does, but there's a, there's a lot more to getting, you know, that perfect piece of fruit, what the supermarket and what our customers um, want these days. Um, yeah, so, and after that, we go into this point in time now where, where we get to see, you know, what we did, what what fruits on the tree, um, you know, we go into, like, so we end up if we, as I said, if we want 100 pieces of fruit, now we want 150, we have to do manual thinning. Um, so, you know, we've got about 70 people out there at the moment um, working, and so they're physically removing, removing the fruit that, um, that we have in excess on the tree. Um, and we are lucky, we probably, we were the first, but we're not the only now, but, um, you know, this, this task was always done with ladders. Um, you know, said so workers climbing up and down ladders to physically remove the fruit off. We have brought in, um, in machines now that are like, we call them mobile factories that, uh, that run down our orchard. Um, you know, so come time to employ people, we now, Hopefully, especially this year in COVID, um, you know, because workers are going to be harder to come by and experienced people are going to be harder to come by and 
there's a lot of people out there that don't have jobs. So if we can um, get a you know get a job that is easy um, and anyone can do it as long as they're happy to come out and, and work, it's not physically hard. You know, as long as they're just happy to move, I think we we you know we I kind of I kind of say we have future proofed ourselves from a workforce because whether it's a school leaver, someone leaving school, whether it's a mum that's just coming back from having a child, whatever that person is, um, you know, they physically, as long as they're capable of standing, um, you know, they can they can work for us. Um, I can just see there's been a question come up here. Um, do you think the customers are too picky with produce? Ah, uh, <laughs> that, that's, you know, Yes and no, but we also demand a a premium price. I, I believe I'm I'm not I'm not a farmer that complains that we don't get enough money and we I have to dump all this. So um, I don't think we're too picky. I think um, probably you know some before as I said, fruit just grew on trees. It wasn't precision agriculture, um, and at that point in time, a lot of we weren't at the you know, the suppliers weren't as fussy and they did take a lot more fruit. But since then, since, you know, we have gone into this precision agriculture and we have gone, we need 100 apples on a tree and then we can get 100 perfect apples. We can grow to within 90% of the supermarket standards. The problem is, is that some other farms might only grow 50% of to that standard. So what do we do? Do we lower our standards or we've, we've kind of have, like we put up hail net on example, example on Granny Smith apples. We used to get 50% sunburn. The first year we put up hail net, we had never got so much money for our apples, but because they were just, there was no sunburn ever again and they were really green. Now that's, we created the problem where that's what we, the supermarket expects now because they know that's possible. So we've, we've kind of done it to ourselves, but we needed to do that to be able to make money because we couldn't afford to grow Granny Smith apples and throw 50% of them out. So yeah, I think I I think that I think that you know there's potentially stuff that we could eat. There's nothing wrong with, but there's potentially a lot of things like you know I go into a supermarket and I see holes in fruit and rot and all. You know, a customer shouldn't have to experience that. Um, you know, sort of thing. So, I've got, I've got a question for you, Jason. Yeah. Uh, what are, what are the main pests and diseases and uh, sort of uh, predators that yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. affect your crops? Yeah, yeah. So. That's a that's a that's a that's a good question. Um, so, as in disease, um, I would say our biggest, well, our potential biggest problem is black spot, um, which is a fungi that we can get over flowering up until now. Um, I say it's potentially our biggest problem is because I've been here for twenty years and I've never seen it. Um, I spray for it. I'm never going to not spray for it, but. And I have seen it, you know, a little bit of it in other farms, but you know, we, we can we can manage it. So it's not it's not a big deal. Um, you know, there's a couple of new ones like Alternaria Spot, which are new, and and there's so Black Spot we have models. Um, I have a RimPro model that tells me today there's an infection period. You need to put this spray on within these 14 days. Uh, sorry, 14 hours or whatever to control it. Alternaria Spot, which is a new one there's no model, there's no, like no one has the exact timing. And the biggest problem is, is the most chemistry these days, we don't have a lot, but most of them only give us three times we can use them. So if we don't know exactly when to put them on, we can potentially waste the chemistry at a time when we don't know. So, um, and then probably powdery mildew, which is, um, which is also over this sort of time of the year, but a kind of, Black spot and powdery mildew, most of the same chemicals treat them. And they kind of, if it's dry and hot, powdery mildew flares up. So, but then if it rains, black spot flares up. So they kind of balance each other out because we spray for one, but it, then if it's dry and we go, oh, do we need to not spray for black spot? Well, yeah, you have to spray for powdery mildew, but then if it rains, you don't get caught out with black spot. So um, that's the way we treat it. A lot of people in the dry, they don't, they don't respect powdery mildew and um, then they could get caught out for black spot. Um, but insects uh, are a lot bigger problem for us. Um, Codling moth is a, has been in history, has been our biggest problem. Like, you know, where to the point it could, you know, it stings the fruit and it could take 70% damage um, mm -hmm. if it gets out of control. Um, 
and in the past it was probably five up to five years ago we you know there's all this um ipm integrated pest management predators a softer chemistry the new chemicals are coming out of soft but they're more expensive but they're softer we went down the approach that we thought we were using the expensive ones which we were told were soft but what we actually were doing was we were we were they were softer but they weren't totally soft and then so we we're actually exposing ourselves to more problems the more we sprayed the more expensive sprays we used the more damage we got um and it wasn't until i think it was about five years ago i i went to a, a webinar with um ipm technologies which is that's their job is integrated pest management and basically in the past we've relied on chemicals and if you reply on chemicals no chemicals 100 percent effective so if it's 95 percent effective which is probably not it's probably more 90 percent effective then you have a 10 percent failure rate and then that 10 percent failure rate catapults overseas and over generation and he's like and i just went like i there was no way known i believed you could not spray like ke chemical is the only thing that could control insects um and then he said that you need to use predators or biological controls, non-insecticide controls to control 80%. So then when you put on your pesticides, when they're only 90% effective, you only have a 1% failure rate. So your number one treatment should generally be nothing or introducing predators. Mm -hmm. And so we, three years ago, we went and we go, I oh, will give this a crack. And after one week we went, we're gonna give this a big crack. And we went right across our whole farm. Um, and basically I cut my chemical bill from $500,000 a year down to $100,000 a year. Mm -hmm. And my effectiveness from about 90% to 99.9%. And it was just like in one year, it was like, wow, how did that just happen? Um, but it was like, we, we brought in, you know, we brought in like lacewing wasps, but soon as we just stopped bringing the chemicals, all these things that we had to bring in the first year, we all were in abundance. Like, now it's like we have a little group and we crop monitors and they go around to all my blocks each day and they they send photos and every time they send a photo i don't stress anymore i said i oh, just go back and check it next week and next week they go and they go oh no nah, something's eating it um yeah so we we have so many predators out there if we just if we let nature do its thing and um and don't don't interfere with nature nature is so smart <laughs> like you know things happen in nature for a reason. Like if you don't go use something to put something out of balance, it's a little bit like the quarantine thing. It's why they wait before they release so many things into the country because it generally puts something out of balance and something else expects. Um, and when that one, that one, when we did do it three years ago, so as I said, I said, we went one week and we're only going to trial one block. And I ended up going a hundred percent in one week later because we were watching one block and we had mealybug and mealybug was our biggest problem in pairs. Um, you know, we just couldn't control it. The more we sprayed, the worse it got. It gets in the, in the calyx. So in the end of the pair where you can't actually physically get anything in there and we're monitoring for it. And we go, Oh, we have three mealybugs per shoot. And I'm like, I'm going, what's the threshold? That's too much. We need to spray. And we had already gone with a, um, you know, for Australia horticulture at, a designated little area of six rows where we're not going to spray at all. We're going to go a hundred percent just predators. And I went, well, I'm going to spray the rest of my farm. And so we went and sprayed the rest of the farm with the newest wizard bang chemistry that was as cheap as you could, I mean, as expensive as you could get and meant to be as soft as you could get. And we went and sprayed it and we went back the next week and where we sprayed, we had 10 millibug per sheet. And where we didn't spray, we had one. And I rang up the chemical company and I said, what's going on here? And they go, oh, you've got your timing wrong. And I went, yeah, I know. I should have never sprayed because it had nothing to do with timing because, mm. and, and what we, what we learned was we went and took our dimple bug, which no one in the world actually thought was a predator for mealybug. That's but we just went the week before in this block. Now there's dimple bug everywhere. And in this other side, there's none. And the mealybug had gone berserk. So it wasn't that it wasn't effective on the mealybug. Mm -hmm. It probably did take the mealybug out, but we actually had something else controlling the mealybug that we killed without knowing it. Mm. Wow, that's that's amazing. That yeah. really is. That's a great discovery. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what about birds? Are birds an issue or bats? Uh, 
So bats in our area, we've only got one block where they've come in last the last two years right at the end. Um, so I, I think that, you know, so I would have said two years ago that no, they're no problem whatsoever. Um, but yeah, you can see that, it's, and a lot of other areas, it's a really big problem. Like they, they have to introduce, like, so we have hail net across the top, um, you know, which, which kind of deters birds, but the bats fly straight underneath it, they don't care. Um, so in other areas, they've had to go to a drape net that's it's a, an exclusion net, which isn't the worst, like, you know, so my future orchard, future vision, future thing is we actually have a drape net over every, and we don't even have to spray. Because if we put a drape net, we have no birds, we have no bats, we have no insects, like it's, we have the insect mesh that nothing can get in there, um, mm -hmm. you know, sort of thing. So I, I think that will, like, so if you go to Italy now, they've got a, a thing called a stink bug and, and nothing kills it except for the nastiest chemicals that are going to be banned. So they've all got no choice. They didn't even um, have hail net for hail. They've all, but they're all going and putting on these exclusion nets because the only thing that keeps keeps it out. Birds are a birds are a little bit of a problem, um, but we're not next to it. Like so, if you go to probably someone maybe ten k from here that's like live like that's farms beside the river, and you know the birds are coming out of the trees from there. Um, yeah, we will have a day or two where they come in and they do it. A fair a bit of damage, but it'll only be a bit of damage in that one block, which in hindsight might be it might be 20% in that block, but it might be two percent, you know, one percent of our entire crop. Um, you know, sort of thing. So we've got a question um in the chat area. Yep. You're supposed to be saying there's a shortage of fruit pickers and the Australians don't want to work. Some reports that are saying that farmers prefer the overseas workers as they can pay less and don't employ Australians. What's it like on your farm? Um, so I'm not one of those farmers <laughs> that's, um, that, that, um, that's saying that. <laughs> so I do think that we are going to have a serious shortage, um, this year. Like I would say in the last 10 years, um, and, and we do use a lot of backpackers, um, you know, and, and probably 50%, oh, probably up until two years ago, probably 60% of our workforce was made up of backpackers. Um, but we, we've more moved to a model now where we employ people full time. So, you know, permanent residents, mm -hmm. um, just because we wanted to have the same people back year in, year out, because we did, we're sick of, we've got the machines now, you know, and, and we can get anyone and put them on there. Um, but we still have to train them. We still have to train them to pick the color we want. We still have to train them to leave the amount of fruit that we want, the amount of buds we want. So, so although we can get anyone to do it, you know, every time you have to train someone again, it's just, you don't do the job quite as good as you'd like to. Mm. Um, and so I would say in the last 10 years, I would have only had, except for people moving on, like, you know, their visas have run out or they've, you know, they've moved town or whatever. I reckon I would have had 10 people leave me ever. And in the last, in September, I had 10 people leave um, to go to solar farms, soap factories, these other jobs that I think that we haven't, like, you know, I, I always just say, I'm going to get the workers because I'm only competing with someone that's paying piece rate and they're not paying enough money. And, mm -hmm. and I pay you by the hour and they've got a machine, they don't even use the bag or they don't have to. But I think we're going to be competing with other industries, um, mm. you know, sort of thing. So uh, I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to get get into too big of a debate about other farmers, but I I do believe that we do. You know, we do accuse people of being lazy, blah 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 blah. But we kind of like there's no other industry in the world that, or in in Australia that I know of, um, that probably expects people to turn up and not get paid minimum wage until they've trained themselves up enough to get minimum wage if that makes sense, like, you know, because they pay a piece rate and most farmers and, and me, when I was 18, um, I turned up on the, on the farm and I picked apricots and I picked 1.5 bins for the day. And I went, I'm never doing this again. One day of my life, this is slave labor. And I left, you know, if I had a probably stuck at it for three weeks, I probably would have got up to the point where I could pick four bins, but in our industry, we're like, we expect the worker to wait until they're good enough to make wages. 
So I think it's a little bit harsh to call people dull bludges and they don't want to work and they don't want to think because we're also not, so the, So this is the thing that I think is going to be a big catch out this year. I think it's going to sort a bit of this out because people are going to have to up those bin rates. For me, I start someone and I lose because I pay on the hour. So I need to get someone and keep them for six, nine, 12, 18 months because for the first month, they might cost me two or three times the amount that it should be costing me. But then I hope after two months, they're, you know, I'm, they're really good. And then I get to make that money back up. Um, you know, we're farmers, we make money by selling fruit, but we're no different than any other industry. We make money from having people do the work that we want them to do the way we want them to do it at a, at a cost that we can afford to sell the produce for to make money. So it's not the apples that make us the money. It's still the people that make us the money. So we've like, and that's what I said. So we've gone down the path and, and I, this coronavirus is going to sort stuff out really, really fast. Um, but I do think that we went down the path of, of platforms um, probably six years ago and to platforms where we're at a hundred percent platforms now from two years ago. And Everyone, it's a big investment. A platform's $150,000 per platform. But I can put any person on there and they can be productive. Um, if the crop's not good or the fruit's more, like I cop that, like, you know, then, then it costs me more to pick it because I've done a bad job. But if I do a good job, I can be as efficient or more efficient as anyone else. What, um, what do you mean by platform? What's a platform? I will, I will show you. Um, and so this just sort of, I'll just go into this this one here. There's lead, this is kind of the debate. <laughs> this um, how long before you think robots are here? <laughs> so, um, so there, there's two. So we've got two forms of things. So everyone loves robots. Robots are amazing. Like robots are going to save the world. Like everyone's this high tech robot thing. Um, so it's the same. When a robot's going to prune our trees? When a I, I, they are here, they, they are in existence now. I've seen them operate twice. I've seen it pick about two bins for the day and it's about a $1.5 million machine. Um, you know, so there's a, they've made a lot of claims for the last four years. They are physically working, um, but before they're gonna be able, like, so they have to be able to come in and replace 50 of my pickers. Um, yeah, so if you've got a robot that's replacing 50 pickers and it breaks, like when we're in a, an industry that has only a window of seven days to harvest and it breaks down, you can't just pull in 50 people because you, you don't have people that know how to pick. Mm -hmm. um, but the other thing is, that I, so I think it will be here in 10 years at best, maybe 20, but there's so many other things that we have. And so everyone says these farms for robots. I'm like, set your farms up for what we have now. We have platforms, we have that thinning machine, we have that saw. So that's what we've gone. We've gone with, and then in 20 years when the robot comes, I'll just set my new farms up for the robot. So I'll show you what, and I call it, it's a factory in a farm. Um, so I'll show you what my farm looks like over a harvest season, which is a lot different to what, um, what most farms look like over a harvest season. Just need to, oh, sorry, here we go. So these machines that we're looking at, I have eight of them. They all can take six people per machine.
Yeah, so as you can see, th we've got little lugs in it. So it's not all about just making life easier for the fruit workers. So we've got three levels of, of workers. Like, so we've got the top, the middle and the thing. So we don't need any ladders, we don't need any bags, but you can see here that these little lugs hold every single fruit. So a piece of fruit can never touch another piece of fruit. So we don't, when someone empties their bag into the bin or they drop a, an apple into their bag and it hits five other apples, it bruises the apple. So mm. all these things about fruit quality and stuff are, yeah, okay, we, maybe they are too fussy. We could eat, maybe we are throwing out stuff that we could eat, but we could actually do a lot better job than what we are doing of growing fruit. Like. You know, these, the, one of these machines here nearly justifies just in the pack out improvement, paying the $150,000 back for the machine. It just straight off without the ease of workers or, or any of this sort of stuff. So, um, but we also, I think we have one here. Yeah, so like now, this is our thinning team going through the farm. Thinning. So instead of someone going up and down a ladder to thin that tree, you know, every 10 seconds it's driving to the next tree. Like there's no physical actual work for, for anyone to thing. And then we have our ground crew come along behind. Um, you know, so there is a lot of, you know, and here's our saw again. So there is a lot of things out here where we don't actually need, like, so robots are cool, but like I'll, um, I will just give me, I'll show you one other. I've, I've got a question and there's quite a few questions coming up as well. Uh, yeah, Jason, but just, while you had that screen, uh, are, are, are the, um, uh, most of your fruit trees grown um, up a long trellis like uh, espalier yeah, so, or how, yeah, so how every, they... so everything everything that we grow now is grown on a single plane and we do that so that we can get our machines at both sides of the trees um, you know because for this thinner to work for the saw to work we need to get it at both sides of the trees right. um, you know so that we can prune both sides because if with the old system, the old bars, like we need a nice straight line. Then we need a nice straight line for those platforms to be able to drive through, um, you know, sort of thing. So, yeah, so that in in essence, yes. Um, if I just can go. And we've got another question. Is your produce sold exclusively to Australia or do you export? Um, so I would say 95% of our apples are sold to Australia. Um, just because the Australian market's strong. Like we complain a lot, but Australians, we, we get good money for our produce in Australia. Um, so, yeah, so, and that's why we don't export. Um, also though, we can't get into the, the likes of China and stuff like that, where there is, you know, probably a really, like potentials for really high returns. So most of our stuff that we export in apples would be a second grade fruit, not a first grade fruit because they probably have a lower standard um, in the thing. Uh, but for pears, we probably export 50% of our pears, um, you know, sort of thing. So, yeah, that, and that's just based off that there, there's more supply of pears than there is demand. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so the money's similar, but if we didn't export 50% of ours, then there'd be more in Australia and the money would be worse. Um, and we have another question. Have the changes in OH&S helped or hindered the work on the farm? I think, it, I think it's helped. You know, we've, in past farms, like we've, farms have got a pretty bad reputation um, for, you know, just for, you know, low paying um, jobs, hard work, unsafe. Um, you know, so a lot of the, so although, yeah, we could say, oh, it's hindered us or whatever, it's also made us do things like get platforms and step, like, you know, make changes of differences of planting on these smaller trees and, you know, um, and it's the same with the supermarkets making things tougher on us. We used to be able to grow these big old trees that we never did anything with and could still potentially make a little bit of money, but we would pick 40 tonnes of the hectare. Now on blocks, I pick 90 tonnes of the hectare. You know, and they, it, it forced us to change, but it forced us to change for the better. Like mm -hmm. we were actually a long way behind, you know, the likes of Europe and those sort of countries when it comes to that sort of thing 20 years ago, where I would like, I, I travel overseas at least once every year, maybe not this year though. 
but um, you know, and it's lots of Europe and to America. And if you went back 20 years ago, we were so far behind, it's not funny, but now you can go to anywhere. Like you don't need to travel overseas. You can go to anywhere in Australia. There is someone doing something as good as anywhere else in the world. That, that's great. Um, I've, I've got a question. Um, how do you grade the different types of fruit? So every variety would have a different grade. Is it based on color, shape, size? Um, how's it yep. work? Because in the, in the old days, you used to see on the boxes, you know, grade A, grade B, grade C for- yep. So, so the, there is still all that, except you pretty much would only have one grade. So say Coles, the supermarkets, they just take what we call class one, um, which is our, our A grade fruit, but we sort of have an A grade plus fruit as well, which go to the premium fruit and veg shops and they pay a premium price for that, um, which is most of what our, say our pink ladies, our own personal pink ladies, that's most of where they would go to because they're uh, we aim for 100% full colour um, apples. So we've just um, we've just installed ourselves now what we call it's a pre-sizer. Um, so all the apples are, are graded into a size or a weight range. Um, so a certain amount of apples fit in a box that adds up to 12 kilos. And then they have specifications like for damage, which could be sunburn, it could be limb rub, it could be not enough colour, it could be a not enough um, thing. So what we've what we've just done now, and, and it was it's been you know, um, a huge huge investment, um, but we've just installed this sixty lane pre sizer. So what we do, it can it can grade one bin a, a minute, um, so that's five hundred kilos of fruit every minute, mm -hmm. um, and it basically we. We drop the fruit in and it goes in and it goes through cameras and then the cameras and a weight sorter. So the weight sorter and then it drops it into the tunnels. So we have 60 tunnels. So for each size, we'll have potentially 15 tunnels, but then for each grade, we'll have 15 tunnels. So we'll have a class one, a class one A and a class two. So, and then that camera, it tells which one, it tells the thing which one to drop down. I've got a, um, I, I have a, a video of, so here's the. So is this also part of precision uh, farming in terms of? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So this is this is like really high tech, um, you know, advanced. Like, but we're not the only ones. There's there's three others of these in the country now. Um, I'll just share my screen again. So basically, the fruit goes. This is the fruit going into a fruit dump here. Um, so I'll just press. Go back to the start. So this is a bin. Uh, this might only be showing us one side of it. So those bins are going along in that water. That's all one class one size and it's getting sucked up into a, this here is like a, a vacuum. So none of the apples can get bruised. So that this here, we put in a normal bin and then it runs it down and it, sort, it sorts it into the lane. Then when that lane comes, it's all sorted into one size. Um, then that sucks it up into a vacuum and then that drops it sorted into a into a, this one bin here that's all the same grade. I actually thought that this was a video of the whole grader. So, so the liquid there, that's is fine. that the wax that they... No, this, this, is just, this is just straight water. Okay. Um, so I'll just... When, when's the wax supplied to... Um... No, that depends. So now if you're talking supermarkets, supermarkets won't take wax fruit. Um, so if you're talking premium market, premium markets do take wax fruit. Um, why, why is that? Uh, because the supermarket, so all Europe and that don't take wax. Wax is just to make it look good. Mm. Um, and there has been a fair bit of back, like there is no reason that doesn't need to have it on there. Um, so that's a, that's a picture there of our premium pink lady apples um, mm -hmm. that are running over our grader. Hoping that I had a video to show the new pre-sizer. But yeah, the new pre-sizer, it has like, so it all runs in water so that it can't, um, so it all runs in water, it gets sorted out, it all runs down those tunnels. You could see all those tunnels are in water so the, the fruit is always floating. Um, you know, so that then fruit can't get damaged, it can't bruise, it can't anything like that. But yeah, so we do have like three classes of fruit. Yeah, no, sorry, I don't have one. You can tell that, so this is our, um, this is a video of one of our new sheds getting erected. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so it's about the size of the MCG. Oh wow! <laughs> and it's and it's, a, and it's one. There's two of them. Um, and, and what what's going to happen in those sheds? So this one here. So we have the one that's got the 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 pre sizer in it. So in the past, in the past, what we did was we had a grader that ran over and then when it would sort it out into the size ranges, but then we'd have those boxes go straight into the thing. So we'd have to have 20 packers because in the bin, there would be 20 different grades of fruit. We had to have one person on each line. The problem is is though that 40% might be in, you know, a certain size. So that person would be really busy. And another person that, you know, might've had 10% of the fruit coming out really had nothing to do all day. So what we've done is we've put in a pre-sizer that sorts it into its grades. And then in that new packing line, we just have big one lines and then we just pack one grade, one size, and we call it rapid packing. So mm-hmm. that, and it's only just started about a week ago um, due to the COVID because the people that are meant to be coming from Europe to, to install it haven't been able to get across here, but mm-hmm. that's just a rapid packer that just, we just run the one size. So then instead of having 20 girls and 10 are going at 120% and five are going at 80% and a few are going at not much percent. Every single girl has the exact, exact same amount of apples to pack. So we're not right. trying to, everyone goes, oh, you know, how many people is this going to save you? You're like, oh, is this, you know, is this platform or is this greater? Is this just cutting labor? And it's like, well, it's not cutting labor. We're making labor more efficient so that we can grow more. We never plan to employ less people. We plan to we plan to impl- grow more fruit, mm. to pack more fruit, to sell more fruit because we can do it more efficiently. Um, I've got another question for you. Um, yeah. Those little sticky, uh, those stickers, those little stickers on on the apples, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it tells you the the t- the the type, the variety of the yeah, yeah. apple, and then it's got this four digit code. Now, is, is that that code there does that tell you which farm it's from and and how what's the traceability with with fruit yeah so it depends on depends on that barcode itself um so if it's if it's coals and woolworths you should be able to track it back to the supplier now with that code um but in the past there was codes on apples but they weren't um it wasn't necessarily that there was nothing to tie it back to but now when we supply to Coles or Woolworths. Our, we, we, every time we use, we have our exclusive own um, stick out with our exclusive own barcode. Um, so, which, which is, yeah, which, which is better for potentially for customers for traceability to get some messages back. Yeah. Um, since that's happened, we've got some really good messages back. We've also got some, um, some not so nice messages back. We, we also had like one big, Thing in Queensland where there's a needle and someone went into a fruit and veg shop and then they come out oh there's a needle in the apple that's come from the you know, and it's and the police like they they were 100% confident the people that put the needle in the apple but they're chasing it back to us and then we have to go through a, a whole thing so mm-hmm. um yeah and it had been through our scanner so so now we have to have internal scanners so it's been through our internal scanner which would pick up metal in our fruit so mm-hmm. um yeah so it's like it, it can create problems, um, but I don't. I don't necessarily think it's a. I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing. And I think for the consumer, it's um, it it can potentially, you know, because a lot of apples just get stuck on shelves. And if it might have come out of the box, then that person packing them can mix them up together, and That's right. you know, someone can see your box on the ground and think that that was your apple, but it could have been come from another box put into the thing. So, yep. Um, that's right. But, but I, I don't know how many consumers are actually would be checking that or um, <laughs> or even if they checked it, know what the, that would mean. Um, we, yeah. we have a question. Are the stickers edible? What are they? What are they? No, made? they're definitely not edible. They're plastic, aren't they? Yeah, they're plastic. They yeah. probably will come out in the end, but yeah. you're yeah. not meant to eat them. Um, so you know, it, there's, a, there's also a lot of hype about that they should even. So you've got two sides of the argument. It's like people want traceability, but then the other side of the argument is like, oh, all these stickers are on the ground and we don't want it on the, like, so it's, so it's a, and I get both sides of the argument and I don't know what the, I don't know what the answer is. Um, That's right. And and, and you can sort of, for the supermarkets, like there's a lot of, like if you go in at some points now, like as I said, there's a lot of new varieties in the last two years. Like 
I remember going into the supermarket probably in April and there's like 12 different varieties on the shelf. The people that are going and, and pressing that apple or the checkout person, they don't know which apple it is. So they, some are $7 a kilo, some are four. They kind of need that barcode to know mm. which, which apple's which now. That's right. So um, uh, you'd need to know your barcode. If, if I was to go to my local Coles and Woolworths, yeah. uh, how would I identify that it came from your farm? No, nah, you, so I, I don't know the 100% answer to this one because I haven't tried it myself, but there's meant to be an app that you can yeah. scan that barcode and it okay. gives you the information. Right. Excellent. Yeah. That's, uh, that's something yeah. to look into. That's, uh, that's yeah. very interesting. Yeah. 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 But, but the problem with, it's not necessarily a problem. You just, you own, like, it's only the people that are, <laughs> that are angry that are, you oh, know, yeah. You never get the, uh, you never know, not, not, not very many people ring people to praise people. But <laughs> saying that, sometimes you do. Like sometimes you, like I've had letters, like handwritten letters from people on the saying, we bought your apple from the thing that was the best apple I've ever eaten and, yeah. and you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and, you know, so sometimes you just wish you got some of those stories as well as some of the, that's, that's as right. some of the negative ones. That's exactly right. Um, we got another and, question. And, and just, I'll just go to that one. The only other thing wrong with that as well is, is that your brand is based off what someone else has done to it in the supermarket. So I don't know whether you've seen some people moving apples in the supermarket, but you yep. can see my machine that doesn't let an apple touch an apple touch an apple and you get someone else see a box and go, oh. Uh, that's just, right. That's right. No, so just, once it's beyond the farm gate, then it's really out of your control. It's out of our control, but we get the blame still. Yeah. <laughs> so, of course you do. That's uh, do you oh, yeah. turn any any fruit into juice, or does does any of your fruit go to be turned into juice? Yeah, so like I, I would, you know, from this plan, I would say at least probably seventy six. I'm oh, oh, sorry, not um, thirty to forty percent of it would end up going to juice. Um, you know, even our really good lines, you know, it's still got at least ten percent juice in them. And, um, and uh, where, where's the uh, where's the factory where they? Um... Um, so a lot of it goes it goes to South Australia. Um, so a lot of it it's not always just juice. It's um, you know baby food and and a lot of these other things as well. So um, like and when everyone always complains that that they they are dumping fruit, it's 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 not that they're not getting paid for it. Um, it's just that it's not viable to grow juice. But it could be worse. We could not have a home for it. And then we really, you know, the supermarkets now, even though they are fussy and we say, oh, we've got to throw 40% out. Well, we're throwing 40% out and it's going to juice. We do have a market for 99% of our fruit, 99.9% .9 of our fruit. The only stuff we don't have a market for is like really rotten fruit. And that's what we give to the, to the farmers or like to the coffee farmers or whatever to feed the cows. So it's just that it's not a high value fruit. So it's not like we're dumping it. It's not like we... You know, we can't, like, we are getting some money back for it. It's just is basically juice price is about 70 or 80 bucks a bin. It cost me $60 to pick it. It cost me $80 to store it. It cost me $200 to put it over the grader. We can't afford to grow juice, but at least there is something back for it. Um, we're nearly at the end of time. I have one other question. <clears throat> uh, it's it's because um, I've always had a fascination with uh, post-harvest technology, and I did, I did that at, at university. Um, how do you store the apples so they don't last what what is nearly twelve months or something like that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. How, how, do, how are they stored? What 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 happens there in a cool room? What do yeah. you do? So there's a few different like so if historically it's it's been um, we call it CA which is a uh, controlled atmosphere which. Um, means that we shut down a room and we take all the CO2 out of it so that then that stops the ethylene production in the fruit. So we'll shut down a room, we'll pull out all the oxygen basically so that, um, you know, and gas it, and then that room is is pretty much stagnant. Um, since then, they've come up with a one that's called DA, um, because the other one, we still had to dip the fruit with stuff that is now becoming illegal. Um, or not illegal, but they're, they're, they're ruling it out and it will eventually get banned. Um, so now there's one that's called DA, which I am not, I'm not probably the, the most sophisticated person on this matter, but it's, um, so it works the, it works in a different, in a different manner. So 
Um, we don't have to dip the fruit. We don't have to thing. We can store the fruit at about four degrees rather than zero. Um, and our and the ethylene production is still stopped. Um, and the fruit comes, especially for pears, the fruit comes out in better condition. The what what we do now with say with our pink lady apples, like we can pull our pink like so. We will pull start, you know, we've still got 50% of our pink lady apples left now. Um, we will pull them out in March. And the ones that we actually pull out in March will taste better than the ones that are straight off the tree in April that we start selling to the shelves. Like, um, you know, there is some things that can go wrong though. Um, you know, the longer you store it, if you do have a rot, if you haven't controlled disease or all that, you can have a, a worse pack out come out from it. Um, but we are... Our, our controlled atmosphere uh, cool room facilities now, um, you know, they're pretty state of the art. They are pretty, pretty good. If anyone's complaining that the fruit's old season, that fruit was, you know, should have never gone in the cool room beforehand. Yep. It would have tasted bad at new season. Yeah. So is there any nutritional losses from the process of storing apples or? Nah, so the only thing that you could, you might lose a little, like, you know, and I'm like maybe 1%. Um, like in evaporation. So your fruit might go in at 180 grams, it might come out at 176 grams. Like, you know, an early season bin might weigh 400 kilos, a late season bin might weigh 390 kilos or something like that, mm -hmm. um, just from dehydration a little bit. But no, no, there's, it's all, it all comes out. Um, and, and what we use now, which is Smart Fresh, which is um, they, a gas that they release in the thing, like it's, it's actually certified organic. So it's not like we are... As soon as you tell someone you're gassing apples, everyone's freaking out. But like, I mean, it's certified organic. So um, not that I'd say that everything that's organic is necessarily good for you. <laughs> right. um, yeah, water's organic as well, though. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All good. Well, we've reached the uh, the end of the uh, the session. And uh, I'd really like to thank you, Jason, for a very captivating uh, presentation and discussion uh, it's uh, it's always fascinating. We we did a survey of students' sentiment and knowledge of of uh, primary industries, and uh, fruit and vegetable came out on top. Uh, yeah. And and it's because people engage in fruit and veg every day, yeah. and uh, it's uh, it's amazing how talking about you know fruit uh, can uh, can be such a fascinating discussion, and really understanding the process by which the supply chain of uh, producing and, and getting the products out there. So um, I'm very grateful for your time today and uh, your insight into uh, Plunkett Orchards and uh, I'm really fascinated by the technology that you use and, uh, and your knowledge. You've, you've really given us a really good insight. And uh, I wanna thank everyone for joining us today on National Ag Day for our Farmer Time presentation. It's the last one of the, the day. National Ag Day is over now, so um, Really appreciate everyone joining us. So um, thank you everyone very much for your time today.